we listen for what the Spirit is saying to the Church today. Our prayer for illumination. In the quiet of this morning and the sound of our singing, in the security of our homes and the business of our streets, we call to mind, O oh God, that you are always present, with, in, through, under all living. You are the love that underpins all human loving, that bears all things, endures all things, and hopes all things. Open our hearts to receive your love. Open our arms to hold all in need. Open our doors to welcome all to our community. Amen. Last week, we heard the opening verses of the what document we call the letter to the Ephesians. A letter not written specifically for the Christian congregation in Ephesus, but probably intended as to be circulated among many churches, back then and into the future, even to Scott's church. The opening verses contained hints of predestination, but there was another motif too overwhelming praise of God for all the blessings God had given the people and in particular for welcoming and accepting them as God's own people. I last week suggested that this was the more important element of the introduction and that the predestination motif was more of an exaggerated way of saying how committed God was to welcoming people into the divine community. This week we have another reading from Ephesians. This reading is more specific about what God has done, contrasting past perceptions with the present realization of God's love. And as you hear this reading, listen for the following ideas. In the past, a great division between people, using opposing terms like circumcised versus uncircumcised, which is another way of saying Jew and non-Jew member of the commonwealth of Israel versus alien and stranger and so on. But now in this reading the sorts of descriptions are one body, one household, one commonwealth, a dwelling place for God. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 22. So then remember that at one time, you Gentiles, by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical examination made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were, at that time, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints 
and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the lord in whom you also are being built together spiritually into a dwelling place for god let's move on to our gospel reading the lectionary this year focuses on the gospel of mark but today's reading from that gospel is the last for a while we switch to john's gospel next week and throughout august and then celebrate the season of creation here at scots church so let me remind you of what's been going on two weeks ago we heard how jesus had sent the disciples out two by two to heal and teach the passage that followed which we heard last week described the circumstances of the death of john the baptist the precursor of jesus in terms of the layout of the gospel it is a short break that gives the disciples time to carry out their mission before they report back to jesus our reading for today is in four parts the disciples return and spend time with jesus then there is teaching and feeding a crowd of five thousand crossing the lake in heavy weather and the continuing ministry of jesus in the countryside Mark's gospel contains two similar stories of feeding a crowd and two stories of trouble on the lake. The stories in each pair sound the same but have subtle differences. Mark is conveying a different message in both of them. Today the lectionary has omitted the feeding of the 5000 so I won't spend too much time on it. The other pair of stories the other story is about the crossing of the lake during a storm. As you hear this version of the story, keep in mind that this is not the first time the disciples have faced heavy weather on a lake. In chapter 4, they experienced a terrible storm, so bad that they thought that the boat was going to go under and they would be drowned. Jesus was in them in the boat during that storm and calmed the storm when the disciples woke him. So, the disciples are no strangers to the power of Jesus to control the weather. Here's today's reading. Reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 45 to 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. After this, uh, comes the story of the feeding of 5,000 people using five loaves and two fish, which resulted in 12 baskets of leftovers. We have uh, omitted that from today's reading. Now, verses 45 to 56. Immediately after the feeding, he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After saying farewell to them, he went upon the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
when he saw that they were straining at the oars against the adverse wind he came towards them early in the morning walking on the sea he intended to pass them by but when they saw him walking on the sea they thought it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified but immediately he spoke to them and said take heart it is i do not be afraid then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves but their hearts were hardened when they had crossed over they came to land at gennesaret and moored the boat when they got out of the boat people at once recognized him and rushed about that the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went into villages or cities or farms they laid the sick in the market places and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed in sacred words of old we have heard the spirit speak anew i don't know if you could notice some vibrations in the building but sa water is out the back pounding a trench um and they choose sunday morning cuz nothing's happening in the area is it let's pray grant o lord that these human words may be the word of god for us this day according to your promise through christ jesus our lord amen at the close of our reading for today we hear these words of welcome so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of god built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in him the whole structure has joined together and grows into a holy temple in the lord in whom you also are being built together spiritually into a dwelling place for god this is lofty emotive language and after a while language like this becomes familiar to us through repetition in church and reading of the bible and that's a pity because actually the letter is saying something quite remarkable so let me first try to defamiliarize i'm not sure that's a word the language for you starting with an oddity the author is addressing people who mostly would not have been jews at the outset of the passage he addresses them as you gentiles you non-jews what makes this odd is that the rest of the passage would make more sense to a jew than a non-jew back then in the first century the roman empire if you were jewish in the roman empire then the division of the world into jews and non-jews would have been an important part of your life for those who lived outside of judea the practices of judaism such as circumcision sabbath observance and the avoidance of local deities if these were taken seriously they would have set you apart from the rest of the city where you lived but if you were non-jewish then such things would not have been seen as important it's a bit like talking using talk of life in perth to describe the background of a person who'd never been west of the york peninsula their force would have missed the hero in fact they might have disagreed with the statements these non-jews were not without gods they were not atheists they had plenty of gods that they believed in and many would have been happy to show respect to the god of judaism and what is more many traditional jewish practices would have been regarded as peculiar even uncouth most people in asia minor where ephesus is located 
would not have been Jewish. The Christian congregations in such cities would have been composed mostly of people of non-Jewish origins. So the author is use, in this letter is using language that was not part of the tradition of his audience. In other words, the author is speaking to those people in terms that they would not have related to or valued in the past. So, if, as I suspect, those people prior to becoming Christian would not have given much thought to the division between Jews and non-Jews, why then use this language in the letter? And I wonder if it is included in part because it symbolizes something that the listeners did know about. They did know about divisions in society. The culture of the Mediterranean world at that time was very hierarchical. Everybody knew their place. So the readers would have been well aware of what, which class they belonged to. They would also have known of the division between Roman citizens and everyone else in the Roman Empire and the divisions created where people came from between locals and aliens, the divisions between slaves and free. A world divided with walls between so many groups was the world that they lived in. So although the language used in the letter does not express matters in a way that they might have used in the past, now in the present it would make sense to them for from the perspective of the present they can see their past divisions, whatever they were, and their present unity in Christ. They can relate to their past experience of divisions and exclusion to the one example of the division between Jews and non-Jews and see how that has now changed. The commonwealth of Israel that the letter mentions has become the household of God and they are equal citizens in this. It's not something with a wall around it like Judaism or Roman citizenship. The wall is gone. The kingdom of God, the community of divine love is what is there. In using this out of place language, the letter allows the reader to fill in whatever is the primary division in their own society, or divisions, for there were a lot of them. Those readers, that includes us. So the first point then is this. We are often completely unaware of the walls we have built in our society. These walls may be very noticeable to someone on the other side of them, and such people may often have something valuable to contribute. A few quick examples. Before the marriage equality opinion poll last year, I recall several people saying that they did not mind giving equal rights to same gender couples, only they didn't like using the word marriage to describe such a relationship. And in that case, language is maintaining a wall. A more general example. Australians often pride themselves, indeed idolize, the concept of mateship and of giving everyone a fair go, the little fowler as well. Yet at the same time, we have an epidemic of contrary practices, one of the highest rates of legal litigation in the world, divisive language about welfare cheats or Centrelink fraud or people who don't really need medical treatment, and a rejection of new arrivals and refugees. And on the plus side, we have TV shows like Upper Middle Bogan, Back in Time for Dinner, or Go Back to Where You Came From, to expose some of those dividing walls in our culture, and perhaps to break them down. In the letter to the Ephesians, the walls have been broken down in another way. But now, the letter says, Christ has made both groups into one, creating a new humanity in place of two, being built together into a dwelling place for God, reconciled into one body. And that's heady stuff. Strong, emotive language that categorizes the changes that come about because of Jesus. It's heavily metaphorical and a touch mystical. Once again, it's the sort of language we've become used to in our church. 
And this observation bears a pragmatic question. What does that language really mean? How does Jesus do these things? The answer need not be all that mystical. The letter seeks to create unity by inviting people into something out there, the household of God, the community of divine love. A common way that human beings achieve a sense of unity is by dividing people and blaming other. Here's a recent example. Trump and Putin met this week. After that meeting, or at that meeting, Trump attacked the US intelligence service, a group that I'm sure Putin is not too happy with. Whether he knew it or not, Trump was identifying something that both would agree on, something that both could blame for troubles and hate, something which would help create a sense of unity between them. From what I've seen, it appears to be a typical strategy of his. During his election campaign, he was frequently attacking those whom his audience did not like, like the Washington Swamp. Such things got him elected. And even if the episode with Putin may have backfired. Jesus, however, did not adopt this strategy. His campaign in Palestine and Judea was not marked by hostility to others and finding people to blame. Rather, he showed compassion and acceptance. Ultimately, it did not get him elected. Rather, although innocent, he was charged, convicted, and crucified. And his death unmasks the strategy of blame. Our letter to the Ephesians describes this in another way when it says that Jesus abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create a new humanity in place of two. What the author has in his sights is not the law which is summed up in the twin commandments to love God and neighbor. That law is the foundation of compassion and acceptance. Rather, it's the law as a culture that creates and maintains patterns, norms, rules, written and unwritten, that enhances divisions for the benefit of some. So let's move on to our reading from the Gospel of Mark. Because our Gospel passage contains four examples of this pragmatic and practical method of compassion and acceptance. The most obvious is the second scene, when Jesus has taken the disciples to a deserted place to rest. Only the crowd beat them to it and met them when they arrive. How does Jesus react? Mark tells us that Jesus had compassion on them. He could have dismissed them right away. Instead, he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The authorities in Jerusalem apparently were not too concerned about the welfare of folk up there in Galilee. They had more important things to do like running the temple and negotiating with the Romans. John the Baptist had an interest in the common folk, but he was gone now. Who would care for them? Who would speak for them? They need guidance and leadership. So instead of dismissing the crowd right away and heading off in the mountain to, into the mountain to pray, Jesus stays and teaches them. He teaches them. And this implies acceptance. You don't voluntarily teach someone whom you don't accept. Indeed, whom you don't have any respect for. Enough to think that they might take the teaching on board and learn and grow from it. Jesus had compassion on the crowds and accepts them. He believes them in them as more than just peasants or opportunities for taxation and exploitation. They are worth teaching. They can amount to something. He's already shown such acceptance for the disciples. In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are not the best, brightest of the bunch. They don't understand and in the end fail Jesus by running away when he's arrested. Nevertheless, Jesus has just entrusted them with extending his mission. In the first scene in our reading today, the disciples appear. They've returned from their separate missions and no doubt they have a lot to report on. At the same time, they would have been exhausted and need to rest. Jesus recognizes this and with compassion suggests going to the deserted place to rest. 
So we see compassion in action in those first two scenes. And the continuation into the feeding of the 5,000 is also an act of compassion. After that, it was on to the lake for the disciples. This could have been another opportunity to take it easy. However, it doesn't turn out that way. There's a strong headwind, so they can't sail but have to row the boat. And it's hard going for them. They're still tired. And incidentally, this story, as I mentioned before, doesn't say that they're in danger of sinking, only that they were straining at the oars. The trip was not easy. Then Jesus miraculously appears, making his way across the lake, walking on the water. The disciples see him and cry out. He comes to the boat. The wind calms. Mark tells us that Jesus intended to pass the disciples by. I wonder what Jesus was thinking. That the disciples could cope? That they should have learned from the previous storm on the lake? Nevertheless, he responds to their call. Jesus changes course and joins them in the boat. The wind drops. Jesus t Mark tells us that the disciples were utterly astounded by this, for they did not understand about the loaves. Usually we leap to the conclusion that what astounded them was the miraculous elements, the winds calmed, yet they'd already experienced something similar. So I wonder if Mark is not talking about the, is talking not about the miracle of the loaves, but about something much more mundane. That Jesus, their leader, would choose to help them. That someone so high up in the celestial hierarchy of the world would take an interest in them. That reaction on the part of the disciples is fairly common. We tend to assume that people with power do not concern themselves with those who are insignificant in the world. How often would we deny God's grace to someone whom we feel is unworthy of it? How often do we feel that we ourselves are unworthy? Yet God acts in compassion and acceptance. The disciples were having a hard time, but could make it. Jesus changes course and has compassion and helps them. The crowd has no clear leadership. Jesus has compassion and teaches them. And so on. And similarly, on the other, at the last scene in our reading, there is another generosity of healing from Jesus. Because we could continue on and analyze these incidents from chapter 6 more deeply, but we've probably said enough about them. For the moment, it's enough to see that in those stories, the compassion and acceptance that Jesus showed, how he valued those he encountered in a way that invited them to join in the community of God's love. Sure, Mark talks about miracles, but behind the miracles lie acts of welcome, acceptance, compassion. And those acts can be duplicated by us if we choose to do so. Let's end by returning to the letter to the Ephesians with its lofty language. In verse 13, the author writes that all this work of reconciliation, of joining and breaking down boundary walls, came about because Christ is our peace. Later he writes that Christ came proclaiming peace to those who are far off and those who are near. What is peace? We tend to think of peace as something static and stable, a state of rest, or maybe like a blissful meditative trance where nothing can lodge in our heart. Yet the stories in Mark suggest that peace is something that is active. Peace is doing things. It is acting with compassion to dismiss barriers and divisions, to welcome others and to care for them. Ultimately, peace is not a state of rest, but of striving, of doing one's utmost for the commonwealth of God, the community of divine love. And Christ has shown, has brought this peace to us. And in turn, we are called, like those disciples, to bring God's peace to the world on this corner in Adelaide, 
and wherever we find ourselves. Amen.